what we've tended to do is pull all the like nasty sort of ugly beast imagery from Revelation and apply it to whatever political opponents we have mm. with the sort of implication that whichever side we're on is headed up by some good, you know, it, it, mm. right? That dichotomy. But you even mentioned it before, uh, how sometimes you hear things like, if we don't get our guy in. Yeah. Um, but that that's kind of strange, right? Because in, in a sense, the story of the Bible and the story of Revelation is that we have our guy. Well, Paul Amicella, welcome back to the Anabaptist Perspectives podcast. So we've done a few episodes with you on the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. and people can check those out. They'll be down in the description. But today we want to get a little more specific. I, I think it's the most requested that we've had on any topic is have you back on, do more on the book of Revelation. So we're going to be doing that today. And there's one specifically that we're going to get into. That is this whole realm of the beast and the earthly kingdoms that are involved in in this this honestly kind of bizarre book yes. <laughs> um, that that that's here. So we're gonna take just that because um, I know the one we did before was more like how do we read this book as a whole. Right. Um, but we're gonna zone in a bit more. So why don't you just take it from here? Yeah. Uh, we'll launch into it and we'll see where this where where we end up. Yeah. Well, one of the things that uh, we were we were saying before um, is that reading Revelation this way, hopefully our listeners have all watched at least the first episode on Revelation that we mm -hmm. did a couple months ago. Um, it, it means that Revelation is a book that has deep significance and practical application for Christians today. And I think the intersection that I want to look, we want to look at right now is, is, is how does Revelation speak to our thinking as specifically Americans mm -hmm. uh, about politics? Mm -hmm. Oh boy, and and just because I'm not entirely sure when this episode is going to be released, right. but we're we're right in the heat of an election season yes, right now. You know, we're yeah. two months out, from two months a, from away a, from presidential elections. Um, right. So I mean, we're hearing all the typical things that we hear in the American evangelical scene, especially, but where it's like who's God's candidate and yeah. all of this stuff. I don't want to get into any of this business because it's just it's just a mess as it always is. But what are some principles that we're yeah. going to pull out of here? Right. So. And and I think this is this is something where um I think we have Anabaptists I think traditionally um have been told not to get involved in politics and because that's our stance mm -hmm. We then um, don't give any more like teaching on how to think about politics because the assumption is, well, we just we stay out of it. Right. But, you know, spoiler alert, we actually don't. Right. We all have <laughs> we all think about Paul, at least have opinions. And that's not sure. um, that's not wrong. But the problem is, I think and this this isn't going to like address all that. But I think this is something I, I think we, that needs to be taught more is because I feel like there's this gap. There's this empty space where we say. Well, we don't get in involved in politics, and that's it. That's the only thing we have to say about politics is stay out of it. Mm -hmm. But then on the ground level, we all have political opinions, and some of us, some people, uh, some people in our audience vote. Some probably a lot don't, but some, do, you know, there's there's a, mm -hmm. there's a variety of things that happen in our circles. Um, but because there's no teaching on like how you should actually think about politics, I think that vacuum is filled by radio podcast like the same yeah the world mm -hmm. ends up teaching us our society ends up teaching us how to think about politics mm -hmm. um, because there's this vacuum and right? that's that's very real i mean oh, I've, yeah. I've ran into that all the time yeah it's like oh well i i don't really get involved but you know i'll listen to you know ben shapiro or whatever right. you know and it's like uh okay so that is still informing you it is right you know and one way or another and because and we almost have no way of of saying okay Let's think through how to think politically, right? Because our official mm -hmm. stance is we don't get involved, right? So I think we need more. Uh, we need to acknowledge. Look, we we all do have political opinion, or not all of us, but mo a lot of us do have political opinions. And um, are we the political opinions that we have? Are they being shaped by whatever society, you know, secular societal trends, or even sec you know, broader Christian trends that are, are secular Christian trends, other than merger of them. <laughs> Uh, are we being shaped by that or are we being shaped by, by scripture? So um, I think that um, one of the things, the place to start 
is to, to recognize that when we speak of God's kingdom or Jesus' kingdom, mm -hmm. I think we have often turned that into some sort of spiritualized, ethereal principle, right? The kingdom of God is like yeah. this theological idea, right? That mm -hmm. That is this, I don't know, ethereal God, Jesus is the king. He tells us what to do and we follow him and then eventually we go up to heaven or something, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in the storyline of the Bible, the kingdom of God is decidedly not that. The, when when we speak of Jesus' kingdom or the kingdom of God, um, we are thinking very specifically of the fulfillment of the, the promises that God gave to David, that there'd be an unending line that would reign over God's people, but also over the nations. Um, and we're thinking of the vision of the prophets that someday God would come back to his people, restore them, and a, 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 the true Messiah would reign over them. It's it's a vision not of some sort of distant ethereal thing, but it's the vision of um, a real kingdom. This is why Jesus taught us to pray, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, mm, right? Yeah. Jesus as the king is not an abstract king, but he is presented in the gospels as being the heir to the Davidic throne, right? The true, Israel's true king, mm -hmm. um, the true yeah, who therefore has has rule over God's people and the nations mm -hmm. in a restored earth. Like it's very, it's grounded in in the hist in history, and also on earth. Right, Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus is the rightful King, who we are waiting for Him to completely trample all His the rest, you know, His enemies and reign on earth mm -hmm. as in heaven. And if that's the case. Um, then that has to mean that there there is at least potentially um, some real conflict between that kingdom that we that real kingdom that we're in and that we're awaiting and uh, the rest of the the rulers of the world right mm -hmm. and that's going to manifest itself different because there's there's some countries and some societies that have been more impacted by Christianity than others and therefore there's going to be some rulers mm -hmm. that are that rule better than others and things like that. But the impulse that we should have is we should be thinking what I'm ultimately waiting for is indeed a real king to return to earth and reign over all the kingdoms of the world and put all things to right here on earth as in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. And that I think can slowly start changing the way we think about politics in general, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, we can't just... We can't just put Jesus and the kingdom of God up into this separate theological sphere. We have to say, wait a minute, when I start thinking about where my hopes are set for the restoration of my country or society or whatever, is that, am I, is that in conflict? Is that um, somehow um, dividing my loyalty to a real actual kingdom that I'm waiting to come on the same planet, right? Or the renewed mm -hmm. version of it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is where um, the apostles, so in Acts 4, for example, uh, so Psalm 2 looms large in the discussion of politics and the kingdom of God versus the beast or the or Rome or whatever. Psalm 2 is this uh, famous psalm where it starts out, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves up against Yahweh and his anointed, the, the Davidic figure or the Messiah figure, right? Mm, okay. And they say... Let's stop. Let's burst their bonds apart, cast away their cords from us. So it's like, well, it's picturing all these nations saying, oh, we don't want Yahweh's king to rule over us. We get rid of rid of them. But then God laughs. He thinks this is what a joke, right? <laughs> Good. You're going to try to rebel against my, me and my anointed king. Good luck. Good luck with that. And then God says, as for me, I have set my, my king on, on Zion, my holy hill. And then Yahweh says to me, to the the implied speaker here, you are my son, the king, the anointed king. Today I have begotten you, I become your father. So ask me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So then he turns back to the rest of the nations that are trying to get out of, you know, to rebel against this. So kings, be smart and serve Yahweh with fear and kiss the son, bow down to the son and and uh, submit to the to the messianic ruler. Blessed hmm. are all who take refuge in him. And that psalm looms, looms all over the place. So in Acts 4, hmm. the apostles just get persecuted by, um, they had just gotten beaten up, I think, as, as 
kind of tended to happen. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that seems <laughs> like, a little bit par for the course uh, yeah. in, in the book of Acts. So um, Peter and John were called before the Sanhedrin and mm -hmm. then they got released and then they, uh, they go back to their prayer meeting or whatever. And in, in Acts 4, the people, they got together after they heard the report of their persecution, they're getting beaten up or whatever. And they pray Psalm 2. Hmm. They say, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth, through the mouth of our father David, you said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. And then they say, truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. What they're doing mm. is they're recognizing in the way that they're being mistreated mm. and in the way that Jesus had just been uh, killed and then, of course, rose again. But they're recognizing, oh, that's that's this, right? When they saw Herod yeah. and they see uh, Pilate and, and the Jewish leaders conspiring against God's anointed, mm -hmm. they're saying, yeah, that's that's Psalm 2. And now they recognize our being persecuted is a continuation of that. Like God's still, mm -hmm. the, the nations are still raging against the rule of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And and the same Psalm appears in Revelation 11. Oh. Yeah, it's okay. it, multiple times. Interesting, interesting. I think. No, that, that I was not aware of. Yeah, it's it's kind of big. So Revelation 11 after the seventh trumpet. So this sort of represents um, uh, the uh, the final sort of, the final culmination of all things. Mm. The seventh angel blows his trumpet and the voices in heaven say, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he shall reign forever and ever, right? God, Jesus has finally mm. taken the throne on earth as it is in heaven. And the elders fall on their faces and they say, we give thanks to you who was and who is, for you have taken your power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be rewarded, etc. And it's recognizing, mm. you know, the end of that. So Jesus at the, at, at the end of, after his resurrection, the end of Matthew's gospel says, all authority has been given in heaven and on earth to me, right? Mm. He recognizes that in his, he's been, he's conquered. He has overcome. Uh, he is now the, the, resurrected messiah who whom so in the beginning of matthew's gospel the devil tempts him with all the kingdoms of the world right if you'll bow yeah. down and worship he's yeah. like because the devil knows that that is jesus rightful inheritance mm -hmm. right he's the devil presumably has read psalm 2 and he says he's basically offering jesus a shortcut yeah yeah it's almost like you can have this right now if you, you just have it right you know, now yeah or you could do it the hard way yeah. right the suffering way the death Ooh. way, right? Hmm. And Jesus says, no, I will trust that God will give me the kingdoms of the world. Hmm. But there's, for him, there's like two options. He could bow down to the dragon and get it that way with no suffering involved. Or he, hmm. could, he could wander around and suffer and eventually be killed and God would raise him up and give it. And that's the route he chose, hmm. right? That is so, but that means a life where the nations were raging against him, right? Mm -hmm. God vindicated him. Um, so this psalm and the way Jesus received his authority over the nations becomes a pattern for the rest of the church, mm -hmm. uh, and it becomes a, I think, a a part of the lens that we look at politics through. Because mm -hmm. I think that temptation that Jesus had in in uh, by the devil. Um, is a very similar temptation to to one that some of us face in the in the states right now, mm. right? Um, the New Testament, Revelation, and the rest of the New Testament teaches that, uh, and the Old Testament, Daniel seven is all about this. That someday the Son of Man would crush all the all the earthly kingdoms, the beasts, right? And he and his people, the people of the uh, uh, the saints of the of the Most High, would reign. Mm. And Revelation talks about they will reign, you know, with him. Uh, but the question is how, right? How do you get there? And um, the Revelation, the rest of the New Testament too, but Revelation through its imagery, I think, helps us to avoid the, the temptation that Jesus faced 
by the devil, which mm-hmm. is to get that result reigning um, through through sort of compromising with the dragon, right? Instead mm-hmm. of suffering and waiting and entrusting God to give it to us. So it's like one option is suffering and patience. Yeah. Right. Uh, but another option is the shortcut to power. So it's exactly. like Colluding. patience or power, you know, you see this a lot. You hear terminology like we need to take our country exactly. back, for yeah. example. And right. that's a very, I mean, not, not secular. This is within the church. Oh, yeah. Very regularly. I'm exactly. from I'm from the deep south, right? Or or south, I, you know, it's right on the Georgia, Tennessee state line. Is that line. the depth line? You know, yeah, I think okay. so. I'm like right there. So, you know. I don't know you, anything about the south. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anyway, so we're from the south, right? And you, and you hear that rhetoric in churches down there. Right. It feels a bit regional, but I know it's all across the country as well. Oh, but, yeah. But you hear things like, yeah, we have to take our country back. It's being overrun by whatever evil Fill force, blood. Yeah, just take your pick. It, it changes over time. It's funny because our, right. our neighbors talked about it in the 90s versus how they say it right. now. It's, you know, but it, there's, when you hear terminology like that, it's, it is kind of this fixation with power is the best I can summarize it because, mm-hmm. oh, if we can get our guy in, our guy, you know, quote unquote, um, then they can use that power to instate da, 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 whatever, right. Supreme Court justice or this piece of legislation. And it always seems like, huh, like that does seem almost like the shortcut option. You know, it doesn't seem patient at all. No. It's like we have to grab the power while we can, because if we don't, we'll never get it back. You know, that's another one you hear all the right. time. Like if we lose this whatever election, take right. your pick of whichever one in the last hundred years. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the, the same right. phraseology has been used yes. basically every time. And we're hearing it right now. Like this oh, is the yeah. most important election ever in right. American history. Right. And we heard that last time too. Yes. Um, so it, but how do we break out of that? Because that is such a hold on, on the church yeah. and our people. Yeah. Um, this fixation of is it because we're trying for a shortcut? Like, yeah. what's going on here exactly? Yeah. And then also too, how does revelation help inform exactly. us? I exactly. feel like that's the other piece we need to bring in because, sorry, I'm not to no, no. not to keep going here, but it feels like that's a big piece. So what I've yeah. heard is like, well, we can read in Revelation all these horrible things that are going to happen. So what we need is the right figures in power that can stand between us and this evil that's going to come to the church. And they're going to help hold back the evil and and allow righteousness to keep going within the church and blah, blah, blah. So they'll use Revelation as the reason for, therefore, you must get involved politically. Right. right. And you're suggesting no, we got it completely backwards. Yeah. Okay. So this is make, one of my make beefs. that case. Yeah, this is yeah. one of my beefs with, with the way that Revelation mm-hmm. has been most commonly read in American evangelicalism, right? Mm. Is that it actually ends up becoming a resource for people to, um, if, against their political opponents and for taking back whatever it is through colluding with, you know, whatever flawed candidate there is, right? Instead oh, yeah. of. Oh, yeah. Because apocalyptic imagery is conjured up every time. Of course. <laughs> like, is this routine? You right. Know, that <laughs> revelation imagery is used. Like, right to get votes or to get whatever, whatever right. it might be, you know. Uh, but, and this is, this is why I think it's so important to, to say, remember that this is a real, Jesus' kingdom is not some abstract metaphorical thing. It's a real thing. Mm-hmm. Jesus is the king because, yes, because he's the incarnate son, but also because he's the son of David, right? It's a real grounded thing. Mm-hmm. And if that's true, um, we can't just start what what we've tended to do is pull all the like nasty sort of ugly beast imagery from Revelation and apply it to whatever political opponents we have mm. with the sort of implication that whichever side we're on is headed up by some good, you know, it, it, mm. right? That dichotomy. But you even mentioned it before, how sometimes you hear things like, if we don't get our guy in... Yeah. Um, but that that's kind of strange, right? Because in in a sense, the story of the Bible and the story of Revelation is that we have our guy. Oh, and it's, it's Jesus. That's interesting. Yeah. Because okay, because I've heard it flipped. Like if they think it's basically like if we don't get our guy in, we're going to lose everything. Right. And it, and it felt. To me, that well, well then there, there's no faith there. It feels like, it, it, or something. It's yeah. almost like some earthly power is responsible to keep 
God's plan and working properly. Right. So I don't know. It just felt weird. It just something's off. Someone said, like, I, I like this. Someone said, you know, you, a, a political position or party or, or candidate can have your lean, but not your bow. It's fine to lean, hmm. right? We all lean okay. political. I have political leanings. I won't, I'll try not to talk about them, <laughs> but um, we all have political leanings. But when we start, uh, when we start having our guy that isn't, that, that we can't say, look, he's flawed. Um, he might be a problem person. I, I, I tend to agree with more of his policies than others, but I recognize that until Jesus comes back, the world's still going to be a mess, right? Mm. If we start going beyond that and, and having to turn this guy into our guy, mm. uh, you, you, it sounds like you're starting to substitute Jesus for one of these other characters, right? And the, book of Revela the reason the book of Revelation is really helpful is it is this starkly dichotomous book, right? It's very black and white. And that's good because it's jarring, right? Of course, reality is very complex, very nuanced, very gray, um, and everything else. But Revelation reminds us that, hey, at the end of the day, um, they're really drawing on the book of Daniel. Um, there are, at the end of the day, the beasts, the beastly kingdoms, and they will be conquered by the one like a son of man, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so what Revelation is trying to do is to tell the first readers, and by implication us, um, it's picturing the rulers, the leaders, the, the forces, maybe socioeconomic forces as well of their day, painting them um, with sort of imagery from the book of Daniel, right? So the beast, mm -hmm. this beast imagery, um, or Rome or Babylon language, um, they come together in Revelation. Revelation uses the beast, Babylon, and Rome sort of interchangeably in a lot of ways. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. And there's reasons for that. Um, uh, Why those specifically? I mean, obviously, well, Babylon, that kind of makes sense, right? The 70 years of captivity, right? Is well, that where yeah, that's coming from? It is. Nebuchadnezzar um, and such. So R Rome and Babylon... Were, are the only two empires that ever destroyed the temple, right? And and yeah. sort of conquered hmm. conquered Israel in a mm -hmm. sense, right? They're the most theologically significant mm -hmm. in those ways. And if you're a Christian, uh, so if you're Jewish, that that really matters. I think if you're a Christian, that matters. But if you're a Christian, you also have the added layer that Rome is the uh, is the empire that that put the Messiah to death, hmm. right? Yeah. And so there's this extra layer of um, of beast to it, right? So Daniel portrayed these these beasts and we won't go into all that but these beasts representing different kingdoms and these you know these are kind of monstrous characters that that mm. reign violently and uh, you know very much against against god and then in in the clouds of heaven coming with the clouds of heaven there's this human figure one like a son of man mm. to whom god gives full dominion and authority over all the kingdoms of the earth uh and he with his people uh will destroy he destroys the beasts mm. uh and then reigns you know forever and, and it's that that revelation draws on when when john pictures the beast that is and there's there's a couple beasts and everything else but these these beastly uh kingdoms he even says some you know one of the beasts has seven heads who which are the seven mount which are seven mountains which we talked about in an early episode that represents the seven hills of rome mm. i think it's just an obvious uh imagery that first readers would have picked up on. It's also seven kings, right? They represent not one individual, but represent Rome, right? Mm -hmm. But it can also be called the harlot that rides on the beast is called Babylon, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's not Rome, sort of historical Rome alone. It's Rome with what Rome represents, which is the power of the beast, this, which is um, the oppressive anti-God, um, anti-Messiah, domination of the world, right? It's the, for, it's the forces of power that are not submitting to Jesus, but are very much opposed to him, right? <laughs> but you could essentially put any earthly kingdom then would fit in that camp to to an extent. At least to an extent, yes. To, I mean, to an extent. Yeah. yeah, we should be careful with that, that we're not, you know, yeah. um, so we want over, to be, oversell it or oversell it. We want to be it, careful but, with that yeah. because, you know, like some are, you know, clearly I think no one's going to argue that... Um, the current United States government is significantly better than the Nazi regime or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, but 
what it doesn't allow us to do mm -hmm. is to say one earthly human kingdom is is sort of subcontracted out by the lamb or the son of man to rule on his behalf. Mm. And then the other uh, one, yeah. you know, Russia is the beast. But America but see, <laughs> is sort of gets a 1099 every year from from Jesus to hmm. to reign on his behalf, you know? But that is essentially that is kind of the idea, right? Like America this is the the ideal at least America has this amazing force for righteousness keeping evil at bay around the world, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. Um I'm not really sure where that even comes from. Like that started somewhere, I don't know, Manifest yeah, Destiny or something. Maybe. But, but yeah. it just kind of gets a little odd because then when you read these sections in Revelation, if you have that right. as your framework, you would automatically exempt, I'm assuming at least, exempt this country from that list. Right. 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 And you would be like, exactly. yeah, but we're the good guys. Right. You but know? that doesn't fit, right? Because the mm. only good guy is Jesus mm. in the story of Revelation, right? Yeah. The other empires of the world are are a mix at best right mm -hmm. um, but all of them are mm -hmm. you're going to see beast in all of them and that's what John, mm -hmm. one of the things John wants us to see and if you actually look at the history of any country you will see plenty of beast right <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's cute yeah. to, to think of America as this sort of force for good in the world and there ha there there are there is a bit of truth there. Mm. But there's also a lot of ways in which the United States has been, has done profoundly terrible things, like terrible things. Mm -hmm. And that would not be surprising to anybody uh, unless they are trying to force the United States into mm. the place of the kingdom of the Lamb, right? Mm. If if we read the book of Revelation and say, huh, Revelation is warning, is is trying to tell us when you see the way power is used, um, you should recognize beast in there, right? Mm -hmm. And when you see the way socioeconomic forces are, are employed, you should see the harlot in there, right? And the beast is always something that's going to be pulling for your allegiance and pushing, pulling you to collude with it and therefore to, mm -hmm. you know, to get power, you're gonna have to compromise on your witness to Jesus. Mm. In, in the book, that's kind of how the book of Revelation sees it, or to kind of be participate in all the the fun things that the harlot has to offer, you know, whether that be um, wealth or um, slavery in, in the book of Revelation too, um, or, or sexual immorality, any number of mm -hmm. other things, you have to you have to capitulate to, to the harlot and and therefore no longer be part of the bride the antithesis mm -hmm. of the harlot, right? If that's the lens that you see, so John is saying this, that's the lens you need to see the world, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is true even of societies like ours that have, yes, have, had in, have been impacted by Christianity. Mm -hmm. But if we start seeing our society with that lens, wait a minute, I see, I see beast in the United States. The United States is, is part of the, the old beastly way of doing things with, with some good, yes. Um, I should be much more, much less tempted to sort of collude with it mm. and much more reticent to say, well, in order to take back my country, I'm going to partner with you um, because I'm going to recognize that that, is, that might be part of uh, what John would see as you taking the mark of the beast, right? Mm. You saying, well, in order to get my to have dominion over the kingdoms of, of over the nations or whatever, or my society, I have to align myself with all sorts of things that um, that are very much counter to what to to what the true king wants, right? Hmm. And so it's a different way. Like, so who was it? Was it Solzhenitsyn? Um, one of those great Russian authors said that the line between good and evil mm. goes straight through the middle of the human heart. Yeah, and I think that sort of the, the the way that Revelation has been read in uh, modern evangelicalism has tried to make the line between good and evil go like sort of with our political party or candidate on the one side and the other on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. But the book of Revelation is trying to make us say, no, you should you should see whenever you look at the king the the power structures of the world, 
or the socioeconomic structures, which is another way of having power, soft power, right? You're supposed to see the line of evil going through it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, even the party that I might that I might like has beast in it, um, mm-hmm. right? I think that's kind of mm-hmm. part of how revelation is supposed to function as a lens that that warns us, that tells us persevere, overcome, don't collude. Uh, which doesn't necessarily mean, which doesn't mean don't have political opinions. It doesn't mean one candidate might not be better than another. It doesn't mean any of those things. Mm. But it does mean that if we think that um, the the power structures of the United States uh, can be co-opted to advance the kingdom of God or taking back our country for Christian purposes, uh, you're 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 sort of trying to hire the beast to do the lamb's job. And um, the beast ends up trying to eat the lamb, not do the, you know, not do the lamb's job. <laughs> but it was so somewhere in here. It's again the fixation with power. I think is the part that that does kind of get me a bit because that's not obviously the example of Jesus. I mean, he, you know, you don't really see him rolling around trying to grab as much power as he can. It's actually the opposite. He like gives up all his power and is ultimately crucified. How? I think the one of the temptations, though, is people like, well, but that's what's necessary to do the right thing. Right. You know, we have to do this for the greater good, I guess. I don't right. I don't know if you have any more yeah. you want to add to, to that, but they're viewing it as really pragmatic in, in their eyes of like, well, hey, this is what's necessary to keep the evilness of, of what's going to happen in the end times. You know, right. at bay, we have to get this guy in right. Right. whatever position to be that that force that'll stop right. whatever evil is right. coming. Well, yes. And I think that's where the idea of Jesus, one of Jesus' goals was indeed to have dominion over all the nations. Hmm. He was, un, he understood that all po- power was rightfully his and would be given to him. Hmm. It's not that power is off the table. Yeah. Right? So, so we don't have to say, well, okay, we're just going to give up power and forget about it. Uh, we have to say, no, God has already given Jesus power mm. and the, and Jesus will share it with us someday. But the, when Jesus, again, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, um, the tempt he tempted, he asked, uh, he said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Mm. That is what Jesus ended up with, right? It's not like Satan said, Jesus, do you want to look at porn? Mm. Right. It was Jesus, do you want what is rightfully yours? Hmm. It was the right goal in a sense. The temptation was to do it by colluding with the beast, mm-hmm. right? Falling down and yeah. worshiping the beast. The wrong timetable as well, wrong right? Ta- or wrong methods. The wrong method mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. bowing down to him, mm-hmm. right? And I think that that very same thing is what hmm. John has in mind here, or what we can read John, how we can uh, apply John in Revelation is is that this this sense that, well, in order to have power to make society what it should be, right goal, you know, um, we may need to do a little bowing to the beast. Mm-hmm. Wrong way, right? Mm-hmm. And John, through the imagery of Revelation, we're constantly being reminded, no, no, no. Remember, this is beast. This is not just some neutral power that you can use. It's not like the force that you can use for, you know, good or bad. This is the This is the beast. Um, and there's this interesting little weird, weird of all of Revelation's weird imagery. This might be one of the weirdest. Uh, there's the, the those two witnesses that yeah. stand up and prophesy, and then they everyone hates <laughs> hates them because they're sort of um, they're, they they pray and stuff like that, and tribulation falls, and they, they can dry up the 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 rivers and turn things to blood and all the kind of stuff. They and then they're they're killed, right? Mm. The society kills them, and then uh, a few days later, God raises them, you know, from the dead. Most likely, those that is a another one of John's strange ways of depicting the whole this whole time period of us waiting for Jesus' return, and the witnesses are understood to be God's people now. Right. Mm-hmm. There's two because um, you know, in the Old Testament, you have to have two, at least two witnesses. Right. Oh, that, OK. Yeah, I got I get it. But now. it just represents. Uh, yeah. It okay. represents God's people. Corporately. Okay. It's, it, it's just a little vignette. Right. It doesn't it, it's almost like plopped in there. 
mm-hmm. as a little standalone uh, episode or whatever, right? Interesting. That gives you a different perspective. I hadn't thought of that one. And okay. what they do, uh, and this is, this is you know, th- there is oh, debate on everything, but this is kind of the, mm. uh, probably one of the most, maybe the most common view and most mm. scholarship on this. And um, uh, they, they're patterned after Moses and, and Elijah, oh. the prophets, right? This is oh, very, this is kind of crazy stuff. But yeah. the point is they're depicting the way that we're supposed to, we're, that the church is expected to be in this time, right? Mm. Which is people that bear witness to Jesus mm-hmm. um, and that um, as we bear witness, God may be sending tribulation and, and judgment on, onto this world, right? Um, but at the same, at the end, you know, the beast overcomes us by death. And there's, you know, that's what happens in that mm. story. And in other parts of Revelation, the beast is given power to destroy them. Mm. And then God brings them back, right? Eventually his people, God's people will be vindicated on the last day. Mm. Those are the pictures that Revelation uses about how Jesus' kingdom advances now. The call in Revelation is, is not to try not to invest messianic hope in one of the horns of the beast, right? One of the beastly figures, but to bear witness to by our lives, by our words, um, is to bear witness to Jesus and, um, yeah, to suffer, right? Hmm. Right. Or, or Paul or Paul, John pictures it a different way when he talks about the marks, the mark of the beast, the mark of God, which we talked about. Jesus' kingdom advances by being somebody who overcomes by refusing to be stamped by the beast way of doing things on your life, right? Mm. And so that's the, the – consistently through the book of Revelation is um, Jesus' people are never are, – are actually very much not supposed to assimilate into the beast, right? They're mm. supposed to not say, well, um, maybe – if we get the right part of the beast, we can get the this part of the beast to do, to bring about what the lamb wants mm. type of thing, right? Mm. It's no, bear witness, uh, expect to suffer and, and then overcome. Mm-hmm. So again, this is not to sell us like, I'm not here saying it's wrong to vote mm. or it's right to vote. I'm not saying you shouldn't have leanings politically one way or the other. But what I am saying is that when, this is part of why we're supposed to read the book of Revelation regularly, I think. Mm-hmm. I think is that it gets this this vision in our head so that when we start, when we start, when our hearts start saying, this candidate, I'm going to invest all of my hopes for our society, keeping our society from going down the drain into this candidate, I start thinking, you know, that sounds a little weirdly, it sounds a little bit weirdly like me bowing toward the beast like Mm -hmm. why whose side am i on right Mm -hmm. like am i why do i expect that guy especially given all of his deep flaws Mm -hmm. um why do i expect why am i acting as though he's the one who's going to bring about new creation or he's the one who's but you know and uh it's that it's not the hey i think he might be the lesser of two evils and therefore i'm going to support him that i'm not talking about that Mm -hmm. um but i think it i am speaking very much against the idolatry that often mm-hmm. plagues the United States specifically, that we think that um, we have some special status as God's country or something, or that a certain political party in our circles is the Republican Party, most predominantly that, that gets this, has, um, is, is God's agent for doing, for doing things. When instead, too often, I think what, what we've seen is, I like to say that anytime we invest messianic hope Mm. into someone other than the messiah that person becomes for us an antichrist an anti-messiah that's all an antichrist really is Mm -hmm. it's somebody who who is expected to do what the messiah will do which is to rule right to rule the world and to fix everything Mm. and revelation doesn't call us to look for one specific final antichrist only revelation calls us to see the way that our hearts can turn any ruler into our own antichrist. Hmm. And the way that, that if we think, you know, Jesus is our savior, but a certain political candidate is our, we basically turn him into a sub savior, which, hmm. which happens with Trump these days. Right. Hmm. Um, and I'm not, I'm only talking about him because that's the predominant 
figure in our circles. I, we could say the same thing about other people. Um, we might be turning, for us, I'm not saying he's the final, I'm not saying any one person is the final Antichrist, but we may be turning them into our own Antichrist. Mm. Right? Because we're putting too much messianic hope on someone, someone who's not who the should, Messiah. Is not, yeah, exactly. Right. So what what do we do? Like, how do we, because this is so easy to, to go down that street, right? I mean, like the fixation with power is just right there. Right. Like w- earthly powers, I'm saying. Like, right. Because it's just, oh, if we could just, you know, get this person right. or get that thing, it, right. we could we could make all the, right. you know, it, it, there's this, ah, it's, it, it's, it's so in us as humans. I and mean, maybe that's just part of our fallen nature, that sense of wanting to dominate something. I don't know. Um, what do we do? What would you encourage our listeners to do? Read the book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, though, like look at it, you know, look at the call. Just have the images in our mind mm-hmm. when our heart starts to say he, he's going to fix everything or she's going to fix everything. I, you know, if if this doesn't happen, I, all of my hopes are my I'm almost have eschatological hope in this in this particular figure. Mm-hmm. Then I should start feeling uh, this starts. That's not the Messiah. I know because Jesus mm-hmm. is the Messiah. And if I'm starting to bow to that to this individual or invest the new heavens, I'm basically hoping the new heavens <laughs> and the earth comes through this person, just in a small way. I get it. Ooh, you know, mm. my heart's in the wrong place. I remember that this person, they may be a good person, they may not be, but there's ways in which the, those power structures and the temptations I'm tempted to will participate in the power of the beast, right? <laughs> yeah. It's really that, I think. So again, it's not don't have political opinions. It's not don't have a leaning one way or the other. It's not don't think it doesn't matter. The elections do matter. Um, but it is um, remember that we're waiting for Jesus, the king, to fix everything, really. <laughs> and that until then, any shortcuts that we try is actually in Revelation term, uh, pictures, it, it may be a colluding with the beast. And we see that play out in real life, uh, the way that... Christians who put this kind of eschatological hope in these figures have to compromise, right? You have to downplay a certain candidate's sins, or you have to downplay a certain way, the way that a certain political platform um, does not fully represent, you know, godly values, right? If, you, if you're just saying, hey, I think this candidate's better than the other, you can still say, but I think that position's terrible. I think that position's terrible. But some people cross this line where they're hard, it's hardly they're hardly able to say negative things about their party or their candidate anymore. Yeah, that's the one that really gets me too. Because at that point, you're also crossing a line of honesty. Sometimes you are, too. But, but that, but see, I think that's quintessential what it means to start colluding with the beast. Right? Mm. You're losing your witness. Revelation is all about Christians are supposed to bear witness to Jesus, mm-hmm. and you are unable to do that fully because you're trying to participate. Uh, in a in an anti messianic way in in that in that power structure. You're, yeah, you're you're participating in the wrong system. I don't know if that's the right word, or but it's least, like you have Jesus and His kingdom, and clearly what we're called to be witnesses. Yeah, and then you have some people over here trying to do whatever, whatever, and, you, and we're getting all sucked into that. And he's like, whoa, 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 you're losing your focus right. on the real thing. Yeah, and I think once you start once you start not being able to bear witness anymore, hmm. then you've gotten then you've probably gotten snatched by the the jaws of the beast right yeah yeah um, so that's just i don't know these are some more pra- these are, this isn't like in depth in a specific passage of revelation mm. but i think it's a really important like way that revelation is supposed to speak to us right yeah but it's interesting if uh, but yet it's been used to flip the other it way has. around it's been used as a cop out right? yeah to that's say the, what actually we should be getting involved in these things and so it's interesting to have you dig into right. this a bit more and say whoa whoa hold you know let's really look at Right. The bigger picture of what's what's going on here. Yeah. With this messianic fervor almost that can get that's so easy right. to do. Yeah. You know? And John's first reader, J- Revelation's first readers were supposed to look at their own society, Rome, mm. and recognize it as the beast, right? Wow. In a sense. Mm-hmm. And then um but but we are still supposed to see power structures as participating in that same there's good it participate because rulership is a good thing as well kingship is a good thing but 
<laughs> it's always tainted by the beast. Yeah. And so I think the call of Revelation applies to us. Don't turn Revelation into something where we have, well, the the Democrats or the Russians or the whoever, they are the beast. Hmm. That's that's not what Revelation says. Revelation says, bear witness to Jesus and remember that your society and the huge, em the, the, the empire that your society is, and our society is a, the United States is a massive socioeconomic, military, political empire, um, is something that is part of, or at the very least massively tainted with the power of the beast. Yeah. Right. It's not those out there. It's not just the, the other party. It's it's where I live and it's the temptations mm. I have. And the beast is not the lamb. Mm. Right. Yeah, that's that's wow. This is this is a lot to think about. And hopefully this encourages listeners to remember our role as bearing witness, you know, and keeping our messianic hopes yeah. pointed towards the actual yes, Messiah. Yes, you exactly. Know? But it's it's just so, and when, I, you know, even when saying something like that, I was like, well, yeah, of course, obviously, duh. I mean, Jesus is the Messiah. But like in day-to-day -day life, it's so, you can lose that so fast. Right. You know. And I, that's why at the beginning, I started talking about how Jesus, when we say he's the king, it, I mean, literally will be, will mm -hmm. reign. Like, it's not just an ethereal thing, right? Yeah. Uh, and that helps me to remember, oh, mm, oh wow. oops. That's so Mas important. Messiah isn't just this abstract theological yeah, term. Yeah. It's the Messiah is the one, the king that I expect to solve all the world's problems. Mm. That's what that's what the messianic king is supposed to do, mm. right? And if I start having that expectation on anyone other than Jesus, I'm following an, an antichrist. Yeah. They are at least to me an antichrist, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's so true. And that is... That is something we need to constantly be reminded of because yeah, you know so we're humans yeah. and we forget stuff and we're like oh but you can get all and Jesus wound up is, into this you stuff. know we're waiting a long mm. time and so <laughs> and so we kind of you know our yeah. our lampstands uh, our, our the oil kind of goes out we yeah, fall yeah. asleep right mm -hmm. and that's the point of Revelation is to wake us up wow wow that's so powerful well uh, hopefully this is an encouragement to everybody go read go read Revelation again yeah you know yeah and, exactly um, be a witness yeah for witness for the actual Messiah yeah and not try to put that on a mere human, yeah. you know, or an earthly power system yeah. that at the end of the day, it's just not it. Not it's it. not the real thing. Yep. Wow. Thanks so much for sharing today, Paul. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode on revelation and politics with Paul Lamicella. If you enjoyed this conversation, go check out our earlier episode we did with him on how to read the book of Revelation. That's linked in the description below. You can find all our content, including others with Paul over on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.